Okay, so I uh, had agreed to go through some of the topics on the final. I'm going to make sure that at least I go through the ones that I feel like, you know, maybe are more difficult or at least maybe were a little more tricky or, you know, whatever. And I'm not going to um, take, exa you know, exact problems from the actual test, right? Um, I'm just going to kind of make them up as I go just to get the, co the concepts down, if that makes sense. So the first thing that I want to do is talk about, um, okay, we'll start with some of the graphs that you've seen. I'm not going to go in extreme detail on these, but you know, I'm not going to do a pie chart. I feel like if you have a question about a pie chart, you can come ask me. I'm going to do, mm, I'm going to make up a list of numbers, 22, 25. 30, 31, 42, 41, I meant 43. I'm going to put them in order. I'm just going to do a short bit, not a whole lot, okay? 62, 62, 67, 69. So let's say I have this set of data. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, 12 values um, in my set of data. And I'm going to first create what we call the stem plot. Um, and the stem plot has, you know, two columns. One of them is called the stem, <laughs> and one of them is the leaf, because this is also called a stem and leaf graph. And typically with a stem plot or the stem and leaf graph, the rightmost column represents, you know, the rightmost digit in your um, set of data. And the reason I say that is because, you know, if these were decimals instead, um, I would read the stem plot differently. So, you know, it's a matter of, how you kind of define the leaf and how you define the stem. So like, for example, here, the leaf would be considered the ones and the stem would be considered tens. So that indicates how I'm supposed to read this stem plot if I didn't have the original set of data. That means if I write a two on the stem line, then I know because it's the tens place that all the values along this row are um, 20s. They represent values in the 20s, right? So like if I wanna represent 22, I would put a two in the stem and a two in the leaf and that two in the ones place indicates a two in the ones place if I were writing the number out and the two in the tens place indicates a two in the tens place if I were writing that number out, which indicates the number 22. Typically we separate um, these values uh, just kind of with a no comma or anything like that because every value here indicates a separate main um, number. So 25, I would have a five here as well. So looking at the first row, this indicates that I have two numbers in the 20s. And if I were to rewrite these, you know, in their proper form, I would say, well, I have a 22 and a 25. Next one, three representing all the 30s. Well, I have a 30, a 31, and I guess that's it. <laughs> then I have my 40s. So I'm going to put a 4, um, 41, 43. I guess I didn't put too many numbers in each of these. Then I have the 50s, and I have a 50 and a 52. Then I have the 60s and I have a 62 and another 62. So I'm going to write two of these because I have to show every single value, even if it's repeated, and then a seven and a nine. So that indicates I have four um, numbers that are in the 60s, 62, 62, 67, and 69. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 numbers um, on my stem and leaf plot to indicate the 12 data values. So, you know, um, Sometimes you see a scale for these as well. It just depends. Um, and the scale, you know, would show something like if it shows a four and a one equals 41, that also can tell us how to read the stem and leaf plot. Because remember, you know, if I didn't say that this was a tens place and I said this was a ones place and this was a tenths place, then I would read this as 2.2. So it's very important to know what these, what the stem represents, what the leaf represents, whether they define it here or they put a scale. Okay, so that's just a nice stem and leaf plot. Nothing major um, there. I want to, actually, I might as well use this set of data to do the measures of center. Um, um, measures of center are the mean. And I think these are, I think these are standard things that you've probably have seen before, the median and the mode, which maybe I'll write in here. So the mean 
basically is the sum of all the values, 22 plus 25, sum them all up and divide by how many you have. And just be careful when you plug that into your calculator. Do your sum first, okay? Do your sum first and then divide by the value. Um, I'm not gonna do that because I think that that's kind of something you've seen for a while. The median, um, in order to find the median, you have to list your data values in order, which these are, before you can find the median. And remember that the median is the middle value. So I have an even number of data values here. Sometimes what people like to do is take off the outers because if we're trying to find the middle data value, we need the number that has the same, um, the same number of values less as they do above. And if you notice, I have two middle numbers and not one. If I had an odd number of data values here, I would have one number in the middle. But because I have an even number of data values, I kind of have two numbers in the middle. So my median oops, has to be in between these two in order to have one, two, three, four, five, six values less and one, two, three, four, five, six above. So that makes me have an even number of data values. And um, when you have a situation like this, you have to find the middle between those two. So um, you're basically finding the midpoint between those two numbers or the number smack dab in the middle, which in order to do that, finding that number that's in the middle here, which is my median of my data set, um, you add up the two numbers and divide by two. So in this case, 46.5 is my median. My mode is the most repeated data value, which in this case is a 62. Nothing else is repeated that many times. Sometimes you have situations where there's no data value that's repeated um, as much, like they're all repeated the same amount or they're all represented the same amount of times, which means there would be no mode, which is possible. Sometimes you have a situation where you have two values or two data values that are repeated the same number and they're the most. So like if I had another 69, then I basically would have two modes. It would be bimodal data because then I would have two modes. Um, I could have multimodal data, um, which implies more than two. So it just varies dependent on your sample. I'm gonna be bouncing around a little bit because of, actually, I'm gonna use this set again. I might as well. And I'm going to use it to find, oopsies, that's not what I want. I'm going to use it to find my five number summary, which indicates or can be used to find my box plot. Um, and, you know, you could do this with a graphing calculator, but not everybody has that. So I'm going to do it by hand. And the first step is actually, um, this is Q2, which is my median. So your five number summary, we already kind of started it consists of five numbers, which is the minimum, um, Q1, Q2, Q3, and the max, five numbers. Clearly the minimum is easy because it's the smallest number and we want to order this from least to greatest, which I already did. The maximum is the largest number, which in this case is 69. Q2, so these Qs represent quartiles and Q1 represents the first quartile which is also known as the 25th percentile. Quartiles remind me of quarters. So you're basically cutting the data set into quarters. First quartile represents the data value that's 25% into the data set or a quarter of the way. Q2 is the 50th percentile, half of the way, which is why it's the same thing as the median because it's halfway into the data set. Um, and then Q3 is the 75th percentile. So what I like to do, uh, I forgot what my Q2 was. 46.5 is my Q2 because that's the median. What I like to do is order my data set from least to greatest. <clears throat> I like to obviously find my min and max that's first and then my median, which is my Q2. And what that allows me to do is make my life easier to find my other quartiles because Q1 is half of, you know, this second um, or this lower half of my data. It's the middle of the lower half because it's 25% of the way into the data set. Well, if this is 50% of the way into the data set, then half of that is 25. So I need to find like the median here now. I'm gonna get rid of these green tick marks for right now. So now if I can find the median of the lower half, then I find my Q1. 
So I have one, two, three, four, five, six values in my lower half. So three below and three above, just looking at the lower half. Here's my Q1. It has to be smack dab between these two because I have an even number of values here. In between 30 and 31, which is 30.5. And if I was unsure, I would just add the two and then divide by two, right? Um, let's do purple. Then I would look at my upper half. I have one, two, three, four, five, six values here. So I need to have the middle between those where I have three below and three above. And the middle or the median of the upper half is my Q3, which in this case, since these are repeated, is 62. So that's how we do the five number summary from doing it by hand. Now, um, I'm just gonna make a horizontal scale here because I'm creating the box plot by hand. And you guys would be, um, let me just say 20, 25, since you would have it on a, on connect, it's either you're selecting the one that matches or just kind of showing understanding of what a box plot is and what it means. So if I'm doing this by hand, I'm creating it by hand to kind of help you understand it. I'm going to, um, and so I'm gonna create the box plot. The box plot is a visual graph representing the five number summary. And it's also known as a box and whisker graph. So it has a box and it has whisker. So the box is created, and I'll color coordinate by the quartiles. So the leftmost part of the box, 30.5, is Q1. And I just, oops, I meant that to be pink to match, you know, what we have going on there. So Q1. 30.5 is my lower portion of my box. My upper portion of my box is my Q3, 62, which is up here, ish, right? Um, this is Q3, 62. The reason I have this horizontal scale is so that I can have this kind of measured properly, um, so that I can kind of indicate the distance between each of these. I'm gonna do my best to draw these straight lines. This is a large box. So this is my box and the middle of this box, not the middle, but inside this box, I have my median, which is at 46.5, which we'll say is approximately here. This is my Q2, which in this case is 46.5. This is almost kind of normal, normally distributed, I would say, based on the symmetry of it. But let's look at the minimum. Um, my whisker on the left side extends to the minimum, which is like here, min, 22. And my maximum, 69 all the way over here. Okay, so this is my box plot for this situation. So we can say that, you know, 50% of the data lies um, less than 46.5 because that's my Q2. 25% of the data is less than 30.5. You know, now it's just a matter of understanding what this means based on the fact that you know that these values are the five number summary consisting of the min, the max, and the quartile. So that is my box plot. So they could sometimes ask you questions about a box plot too. This is almost like normally distributed because it's almost kind of symmetric, which is a term that you might hear, um, symmetric and bell-shaped. But you're not going into extreme detail and not, at least in this class, right, of that. Um, okay, so I'm kind of in the statistics realm of things. So. Let me talk a little bit about probability because I know that everyone loves probability and I'm not going to do a lot of examples, but what I will do are these two cases, the addition rule, which gets everybody every time. And I think there potentially might be a multiplication rule. Multi, that's a L. <laughs> M. The addition rule is, I'm going to say the or case, okay? That's an indicator that you're going to use this rule when you hear or. And the multiplication rule indicator is when you're selecting more than one. Kind of one, more than one event, more than one card, one, more than one marble, you're selecting more than one. So I'll do as many examples as I can, but I'm trying to cover as much information as I can without making this video too long. But, um, okay. So, Let's do a little probability. The addition rule states, the probability of A or B 
is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. And when you're dealing with the multiplication rule, you have to determine whether you have what we call independent events or dependent events. What the heck does that mean? Independent events with replacement, and I'm going to show you what I mean. I'm just going to put this here for now, and then without replacement. Maybe you already know what I mean. So, sometimes you hear the term mutually exclusive events, which means there's no intersection. They cannot happen at the same time. And what that states is that the P of A and B is zero. Okay, these are just the notes, right? Um, let me do read. Okay. All right. Now let's actually use these. Okay. So let me start with. I guess I'll start with a bag of marbles. I'll do a bag of marbles, and then I'll do a deck of cards. Okay, because a deck of cards is like standard example. Bag of marbles, deck of cards, standard examples and probabilities. Um. Bag of marbles has, I'm gonna say, 10 blue marbles. We'll say it has four green marbles. And then five red, okay. I want, and I'm just gonna start with the basic probability first. What is the probability? And this is the notation, by the way. What is the probability that I select can't spell today, it's your use. What is the probability? So I'm going to select one marble at random, okay? This has to be random, otherwise my calculations are off. This is randomly selection, randomly selecting. I select one marble. What is the probability that the marble is a blue or green? Let's try the color coordinate again. Actually, let me not do the or yet. Let's just do a basic probability, okay? What is the probability that it is a blue, period? Let's just do that, then I'll do the or case. Okay, to find or to determine probability, you have to have the total sample space. In this case, the total amount of marbles before I could determine anything. And so I would probably be doing that initially, counting how many total marbles I have. 10 blue, 4 green, 5 red is going to give me 19 total marbles. So that means that's my denominator out of 19 marbles. So technically, you know, when you're doing probability, it's out of the total how many follow what you want. In this case, blue. Well, there's 10 blue out of 19 total marbles. So my probability here is 10 out of 19. Now, because you can represent probability in fraction form, you have to be able to simplify the fraction if it does, which in this case, it doesn't, because 10 and 19 have nothing in common. But you might also round it, let's say I round this to the nearest 10 hundred thousand, which is the third decimal. Um, I got 0.52631578944, blah. So if I'm rounding to the nearest thousand, a three is next to the sixth, I would look at this number here and if it's less than five this stays at six if this number is five or more it goes th then this is going to change to a seven um i have this squiggly equal sign because it's an approximation and not exact right approximately equal to that now this is just if you are asked you know for that decimal version what is the probability that i get um a blue um, or we'll just do a or case a blue or green so this is the or case um, and this is a nice basic or case technically you're still out of 19 but what I like to do is for me to deal with this or case I know I'm going to be adding the two situations and subtracting the intersection. So I kind of put it all over one denominator because it's going to be over one denominator. It's all out of 19. Now I have to count how many blue I have. 
and so I have 10 green. And how many green do I have? I have four green. And I'm subtracting the intersection if there is an intersection, but there's no such thing as selecting a blue and green marble if I'm only picking one. It's never going to happen, which means that this intersection is zero. Or I can state that these are mutually exclusive events because they cannot occur at the same time. If I'm only selecting one marble, I'm never going to get a blue and green. So I'm doing this part, right? I'm taking the probability of the first. I'm adding the probability of the second. I'm subtracting the probability of both. I'm not going to get the probability of blue and green if I'm selecting one. So these are mutually exclusive, which is where this zero comes from. You might naturally just do the sum. So 14 over 19. I'm not going to do a lot of examples from this bag of marbles because I want to get into a deck of cards where I'm not going to get mutually exclusive events because that's where some of the stuff gets funky. So I have a standard deck of cards and um, your standard deck has 52 total. Um, two colors, red and black. You have four type uh, four types of four suits you have diamonds I'm gonna do my best to just this as fast as I can hearts because it's always possible that you can see cards with probability you have spades and you have clubs right so diamonds and hearts are red spades and clubs are um, black and because I'm taking 52 cards and dividing it into four pieces there's 13 of each suit these are called the suits um then you have your numbered cards they're numbered from two to ten and there's four of each because there's a two of diamonds a two of hearts a two of spades a two of clubs and then you have your jacks your queens your kings and then your aces these are called the face cards these guys and then the aces are just their own thing. Sometimes people consider them low, sometimes people consider them high. It just depends on what game you're playing. That doesn't matter. <laughs> there's four of each card. Four jacks, four queens, four kings, because there's a king of diamonds, a king of hearts, a king of spades, a king of clubs. There's a queen of diamonds, a queen of hearts, a queen of spades, right? Um, and that gives us 52 total cards. So that's just a quick gist. If you need to look at it before, you know, just kind of revise, like look at it again um, before you do this probability with me, that's fine. You can pause the video. A lot of times I tell my students if they're in my statistics class, I'm like, yo, go play with a deck of cards because that's the only way you're going to get experience if you don't have the experience. Okay. Um, so. Let's assume that I'm selecting one card at random. Okay, always at random. And I select, I'm just gonna make it a king. What's the probability of me selecting a king? Well, it's out of 52, because there's 52 total cards. How many kings are there? Four kings, out of 52 total cards. Uh, four goes into four at once, four goes into 52, 13. This is also known as 1 out of 13, which is approximately 0 0.077, if I'm rounding like that. <clears throat> Standard, like basic probability question. Now, this is not any special situation. This is not an addition rule. This is not a multiplication rule. What happens if I say, find the probability of getting a queen or a king? Whenever I hear the or case, I set it up. I know I'm going to add two scenarios and subtract the intersection if there is one. It's out of 52 cards. How many queens do I have? Well, this is the number of queens. How many kings do I have? Well, this is the number of kings. Is there an intersection? Do I have a queen of kings? Do I have a queen king card? There's no such thing as a one card that is a queen and a king. So this is a zero, which means these are mutually exclusive events. And now the probability is 8 out of 52. I don't think, yeah. 
So 4 goes into 8 twice, 4 goes into 2 plus 2 13 times. Okay, addition rule. What happens if I say find the probability of a king or a diamond? And remember that you guys can pause this at any point if you need to relook at that. I'm going through a little bit faster because it's a review and I have a lot to cover. So I want to do a few examples, but like I said, you could pause, you could rewind at any point in time. I have the OR case. Again, I'm setting it up the same way. I'm going to add two scenarios, subtract an intersection. If I have one, it's out of 52 total cards. So now I have to figure this out. I have how many kings? I have four kings. This represents the number of kings. Okay, on top. How many diamonds? I said there's 13 of each of these. So there's 13 diamonds, okay? Now, I have to subtract the intersection if there is one. And in this case, is there a king and a diamond? Is there a king of diamonds? Is there a card that is a diamond and a king? There is an intersection because there is a king of diamonds. So in this case, there is one card that is both the king and the diamond. It is the intersection of the two. And because this value is not zero, these are not mutually exclusive events. There is an intersection, so I have to subtract that. And the reason that this happens is because we included the king of diamonds when we counted the kings here. We included the king of diamonds when we counted it here. So the king of diamonds was included twice in this calculation, which is not fair because every card should be represented once. So we subtract the intersection and then we simplify and then so on and so forth. So this is an example of the addition rule when I don't have zero here. This is the intersection if there exists one. I'm going to select two cards here, okay, for D and E. I want the probability that I select two cards and they are both kings. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say with replacement. So what does that mean? Now, first of all, when I select more than one card, I'm going into the multiplication rule when I'm selecting more than one which means I'm multiplying, right? I'm multiplying, multiplication rule, multiplying. I'm multiplying two, key, two things. What am I multiplying? Well, I'm basically multiplying the two events, me going to this deck and selecting a king and then going back to the deck and selecting another king. That's what I want here. Select two cards, both of them kings. If I were selecting three cards, I'd have three things that I'm multiplying. What does the with replacement mean? The width replacement means that I'm going to select the first card and then put it back. I'm replacing it into the deck. And then I'm going to pick the next card and replace it back. And what that means is that when I put the king back into the deck, I'm not affecting the amount of cards, of total cards in the deck. So first, let's just select the first card, right? I go to this deck of cards and I pick a king. Well, there's four kings out of 52 cards. I go and I put it back. I put it back, right? So that means I still have 52 cards in the deck because I put the king back. So I'm not affecting the amount of cards in the deck. I'm also not affecting the amount of kings for the second selection. I'm not affecting the second probability. So they're what we call independent events. This probability, this event occurring is not dependent on what's happening here because I'm putting it back. I still have the same number of kings out of the same number of total. Um, 16 out of 2704, and then, I don't know. Why did that come in? Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> Computers. And then just simplify. You know how to plug that into your calculator. But what happens if I want the probability of both kings? Two cards I'm selecting again, and I say without replacement. I don't have to directly tell you with or without replacement. I can also say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep the card. I'm not replacing it, right? Same thing as saying without replacement. Because I'm selecting two, I'm multiplying two scenarios. Um, <clears throat> the first one is the king selection, four kings out of 52 cards. But I'm not replacing the king now. 
I'm keeping it. Which means that there's only 51 cards left in the deck. So now look at this. I'm affecting the probability of the second selection because of what I'm doing in the first. These are dependent events. I'm affecting that second probability because of the fact that I... <laughs> Sorry. I spelled that wrong. Um, I'm affecting the second probability because of the fact that I have kept the card on the first event. So the first event of what's occurring is affecting the second so the second is dependent on the first. They're dependent events. And now, because I'm selecting two kings, I only have three left. So this changes now into 12 over whatever that is, 2652. So that's what I mean by, and I don't think you have a significant amount of, like, uh, I don't think I put too much probability on the test. You, you're definitely going to see your addition rule, basic probability. You might see one of these potentially, um, not an extreme amount, nothing crazy. I'm trying to get through this as fast as I can. Um, I'm going to uh, look at slope intercept form because I think there were a few that had issues with slopes and lines. Um, y equals mx plus b is your slope intercept form. m is your slope, b is your y intercept. You can also determine a slope between two points with what we call the slope formula, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This is um, oops, change in y over change in x, rise over run, different ways of saying the same thing. Um, I will graph a couple of these and talk about slope from the graph as well because sometimes seeing it I think helps. So I'm going to graph two lines. One of them is going to be nice slope intercept form and the other one is not. 2x minus 3y is so Um, I'm going to draw a rectangular coordinate system for both of them. Now, personally, I would approach these both a little bit differently because of their representation of their equation. What I mean by that is I like to graph quickly, efficiently, um, whatever I can, you know, the quickest, most efficient way that I can. So it sometimes depends on the representation or the form of the line, you know, what form it's in. Let me just set this up, two, four, so each one of these tick marks is a one. We should always label our graphs if we're doing this by hand, right? Okay, what do I mean by that? And drawing coordinate systems are so complicated. But <laughs> okay, in my first one. Okay, looking at my first form, this is a linear equation. It looks exactly like it's in y equals mx plus b form, doesn't it? It's directly in slope intercept form, where the slope is the coefficient or the number attached to the x. And the y-intercept is that constant by itself. So what is a y-intercept? A y-intercept is a point that lies on the y-axis. It crosses the y-axis. It touches the y-axis. And the only way that that can happen is if the x-coordinate is zero. So this is indirectly giving me a point on this graph. So I'm going to use that. This is where the graph is going to cross or touch the y-axis. Why is the x-coordinate zero? Because I'm not moving horizontally. Whenever you plot points, you have to move horizontal for x and vertical for y. There's no horizontal for x. That's why the x-coordinate is zero. And that's why if we have a y-intercept, we automatically know that the x-coordinate has to be zero. Now, the slope is not a point. It is a rate of change. Change in y over change in x. Vertical change over horizontal change. And because this is negative, my vertical change is going to go down. 
So down is negative for vertical, left is negative for horizontal, right? Right is positive for horizontal change, up is positive for vertical change. So that negative is only going to apply to the top or bottom of this fraction. So I'm going to put it on the top, negative 3 over 2. So my m is negative 3 over 2, which means from this point, my, my change in y is negative 3 down 3. 1, 2, 3, which lands me here. That's not my point. I then have to go in the positive x direction, 2, 1, 2, before I drop my point. Now it's a rate of change, which means I could do that again. 1, 2, 3 down and over 1, 2, drop my point. And what that does is it gives me my line for this graph. And check this out. If I were to look at this point, this looks like an x-coordinate of 2 or y-coordinate of negative 1. This is an x-coordinate of 0 or y-coordinate of 2. <clears throat> I want to verify this slope here just to show you. And so show you the slope formula. If I want the slope between two, two points on a graph, I could look at the graph and determine the rate of change by change in y over change in x. But I can also take the y-coordinates and subtract them. And it depends which one is first. It doesn't matter. So if this is my first one, this is my second one. My first y-coordinate is negative 1 minus my second y-coordinate. And then my first x-coordinate is 2 minus my second x-coordinate. When I simplify, you see how I get the same thing I started with. Now I'm just verifying that, but I'm also showing you how to use that slope formula and determine the slope between two points either from a graph or from that slope formula. For this one, and this is my preference, and I think it's good practice to find y-intercepts and x-intercepts, I'm going to find the y-intercept first. This is in standard form. I can convert this into slope-intercept form, but for me that takes longer, um, and I prefer to do it the quickest, most efficient way, and so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to find the y-intercept first. And I said before that every y-intercept always has an x-coordinate of 0 because it would not be on the y-axis if it didn't. And I'm doing it this way also to practice finding y-intercepts from graphs here, which means that x has to be 0. I replace this x with 0, which means I get 2 times 0. which means I get 2 times 0 minus 3y is 6. This is 0 minus 3y is 6. 0 minus 3y is negative 3y. And then I'm using my properties of my, my properties of equality. If this is negative 3 times y, to get, you know, inverse operation, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 3. And what happens is negative 3 divided by negative 3 is 1. 1y is equal to 6 over negative 3, which is negative 2. When x is 0, y is negative 2. This is my y-intercept. I'm going to do the same thing to find my x-intercept. However, if it is a point that crosses the x-axis, then the y-coordinate has to be 0. Because if it's on the x-axis, that means I didn't move vertical from the, the origin. So the, the y um, coordinate has to be 0. So using this equation to find the x-intercept, I'm going to now replace y with 0. And then I can find 2x minus 0. 2x is 6. Inverse operation. Divide both sides by 2. x is 3. So that means when y is 0, x is 3. If I were plotting that, that's on the x-axis. And now I have this. And I, I kind of did, I just wanted to show you, um, you know, these two different approaches, but not only that, within them, I'm showing you how to find intercepts, you know, algebraically. And also, I did, I'm showing you how to find slopes between two points. Like, I don't know the slope of this line. I could determine it by looking at this graph. I would go up 2 and over 3. Or, I have these two points. This one is... Um, 3, 0, 
and this one is 0, negative 2, I can use my slope formula. Take my second y and subtract my first y, minus negative 2. Take my second x and subtract my first x. I get positive 2 over 3, which is what I said. I would go up 2 and over 3 to get to this point from this point. So just, you know, practicing a few different things um, in the same problem, if that makes sense. Um, I'm going to send this to you guys if you want, but this is just to determine if two triangles are congruent. You don't have to memorize this. It's literally just as it shows. If So side, side, side. If three sides of a two triangles are the same, then the two triangles are congruent, if that makes sense. Right? Side angle side. Side angle side means that two sides and the interior angle. So this side, this angle, this side. If I have a side angle side case where this side is congruent to this side, this angle is congruent to this angle, and this side is congruent to this side, and it has to be side angle side, then I have two congruent triangles. Angle side angle also applies where this angle, this angle, the middle or the interior side and then this angle if that's the case angle side angle the two triangles are congruent and then so on and so forth okay angle angle side this one is specific hypotenuse and leg for two right triangles if the hypotenuse which is the longest side opposite the right angle is equal to the hypotenuse of another triangle and one leg is congruent to the other leg then the two triangles are congruent and this is like, you don't even have to memorize this because you can have these on your, on your test. So it's just a matter of identifying those specific scenarios. If you have them, then you have congruent triangles. So if you don't already have um, a picture like this, I can share these notes. So I had, you know, some questions with angles. Um, Acute angle, does anything, I'm, I don't have to, I was going to draw it, but an acute angle, to me it sounds like what it is, it's anything less than 90 degrees, it's cute, <laughs> less than 90 degrees, obtuse, greater than 90 degrees, okay, um, complementary angles, uh, Sum is 90. I don't know why I'm going in a diagonal, but that's how my <laughs> supplementary angles just add up to 180. These are just things to know, right? Um, what I'm going to talk about are these parallel lines with the transversal. Because I had some questions uh, regarding these. I think maybe, I, I hope... Um, so L is parallel to M. I think maybe this test is a little nicer than the midterm or I don't know, depending on you know what stuff you like. But um, so if I give this angle here, let's call it 35. I have a lot of different things going on here, okay? I have what we call vertical angles. This angle and this angle are vertical angles, so they're equal. I have um, what's called supplementary angles or linear pair because they create a line, and if the line is 180 degrees, then that means that this angle and this angle right here have to add up to 180 degrees. They have to be su supplementary. <clears throat> so I would do 180 minus 35 to get this one, 145. And look at this. This is an obtuse angle. It's bigger than 90 degrees. This is an acute angle. It's less than 90 degrees. So these add up to 180. This makes this one 145 because these are vertical angles. Now we also have what's called alternate interior angles. Alternate interior. Interior implying like in between the two parallel lines. So angles in here are the interior. Alternate meaning opposite sides. So 145 and this angle here are alternate interior, which are equal. Um, alternate interior angles. 35 and this angle here are alternate interior, which are equal. 
Same thing with alternate exterior angles. Exterior or outside of these parallel lines. Alternate this one and this one. 145 are equal. Alternate exterior. Alternate exterior angles. This one and this one. Alternate exterior angles are equal. This all makes sense because these are vertical, these are, right? Like it all kind of goes together. Now we also have what's called um, same side interior, same side on the same side interior in between the two parallel lines. So that's this one and this one, same side interior, which are supplementary, which they are, right? Based on all the other properties. Same side interior, these are on the same side and their interior are supplementary. Same side exterior, same side exterior are supplementary. Same side exterior, same side exterior are supplementary. Um, corresponding, just different terms, and I get, I'll uh, write this all down. Corresponding angles, this one and this one are corresponding. One of them is in and one of them is out on the same side. Corresponding are equal. This is corresponding, this is corresponding. These are corresponding angles. These are corresponding angles. Right. So just, you know, once you're given one of these angles, you just use what you know to get the rest of them and then um, you should be good. So, let's see. Um, Properties of equality, I'm not really going to go over that. I could put it in here, but, you know, um, what that means is if I have A equal to B and then I add the same number on both sides, then that's the addition property of equality. <clears throat> it's just kind of those properties of equality are just helping you understand how to solve linear equations, which <clears throat> you might already know how to do, or solve equations in general, but you have these properties that apply. So, um... I'll put, I'll put that on these notes as well. So pie chart, stem plot, you have frequency table, which is also, um, I didn't do it because I feel like it's standard stuff. I'll briefly touch base on it. Um, I'm just gonna make a really small frequency table. So a frequency table consists of values here, which could be like this classes and then numbers here, which are called the frequencies. And what this means is that five numbers from my data set, whatever it might be, lie in this interval. So, so sometimes what you're asked to do with these frequency tables, and that's why it's not a major thing, it's just determine what the frequencies are for each class, which means you're literally just trying to figure out how many numbers from the data set are in this interval. How many numbers from the data set are in this interval? Inclusive, meaning including the end. So six numbers from my data set are between 30 and 39 inclusive. Seven numbers from my data set are between 40 and 49 inclusive. Um, and the sum of this column tells me there's 18 total data values. So you can always verify if you have the values correct based on the sum of that column has to match how many total data values you have. So I, you don't have a whole lot with frequency tables. You're not creating it or anything, but I, I do believe you're tr determining the frequency based on the class, if that makes sense. Um, slopes, graphs, intercepts, parallel lines. Um, I'm just going through some of the topics. Parallel lines, you know, if they are parallel, parallel lines, they move the same way. They have the same rate of change. They just have the same slope. So if you have parallel lines, you know that you have the same slope, or they have equal slopes. Um, polygons. Regular polygons mean that you have equal sides and equal uh, angles. So any polygon, let's say this is a hexagon, which doesn't look regular, but that's, you know. Oh, oh wait, I think, do I have anything in here that I can use? Do I have a hexagon? Oh, thank you. Hexagon. Nice. Okay, that's a regular hexagon. It would be very difficult for me to draw accurately because 
regular means that all the sides have to be the same, and if they're not, it's not regular. So this is a nice looking regular polygon. All the sides are the same. A um, couple things to determine the central angle, central angles. These are the angles that are in here. If the polygon is regular, oh, drawing these. If the polygon is regular, then these angles here have to be the same. And if you look at them, if I draw all of them, they make a circle. So to find a central angle in something like this, you're just taking 360, which is a total circle, and dividing it by how many sides? In this case, six. So I know that each central angle in this is 60 degrees. And that can help me find some of these other angles. Um, there are a couple formulas. Um, an interior angle and a regular polygon is 180 minus N over N. What that means is these angles here, you know, um, you know, what happens if you're asked to determine this angle? Um, well, <clears throat> to get the sum of the interior angles, there's a little formula, which is just 180 minus N. <sighs> Off the top of my head, let me just verify that. Sum of interior angles which is, oh, 180 times, look at that. Hold on, hold on, let me check this. Hold on, hold on, gotta fix that. See what happens, that's just my, because I don't do this as often. 180 times n minus two. Oh boy, it's gonna run. My computer's tripping, hold on. Okay, yeah, 180 times n minus two. So then this is 180 times n minus two over n. So what does that mean? So um, n is the number of sides of your polygon. So in my example here, my polygon has six sides. So if I want the sum of all these interior angles, then I would say 180 times six minus two because my hexagon has six sides. So this simplifies into 180 times four. So 720 is the sum of all these angles, the sum. If I want one of them, then I just have to divide that by six because, um, because there's six of them and they would be equal if it's a regular polygon, okay? Which is why this interior angle formula works because you're taking the sum of all of them, dividing by how many sides you have. So if I do that, I get 120 for each. So if I do 120, 120, 120, 120, right? That should add up to 720. And if you look at them, they look like obtuse angles, which 120 degrees is an obtuse angle. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to exterior angles, just talking about polygons a little bit, an exterior angle, if I'm drawing that correctly, it's kind of like if I extended this, how much is this angle? Well, if I know this is 120 and this is creating a line, then they have to be supplementary. This would have to be 60. So if I could determine the interior angles, I could determine what we call the exterior angles. This is an exterior outside, right? And it all depends on the type of um, polygon I have. And, and it also depends if it's regular or not. I'm talking specifically about regular polygons, which I think you will see on um, this test. So just kind of like a quick little gist of what you guys have. If you have any particular questions, um, then, you know, please email me. And if you, if you don't, then good luck and you'll be all right. Okay. Just let me know if you have any questions.